The Indian in the Cupboard by Lynn Reed Banks. Chapter 5. Tommy. Omri felt himself grow weak. What an idiot he'd been. Not to have realized that the man, and not just the medical bag, would be changed. Or had he? After all, what did he need more than just a bandage of the right size for the Indian? Someone of the right size to put it on. And... Unless he was sadly mistaken, that was just what was waiting for him inside the magic cupboard. He unlocked the door. Yes, there he was, pink-cheeked and tousle-headed under his army cap, his uniform creased and mud-splattered and blood-stained, looking angry, frightened, and bewildered. He rubbed his eyes with his free hand. Praise be for a bit of daylight, anyway, he said. What the? Then he opened his eyes and saw Omri. Omri actually saw him go white, and his knees gave way under him. He uttered a few sounds, half curses, and half just noises. He dropped the bag and hid his face for a moment. Omri said hastily, Please, don't be afraid. It's all right, I... Then he had an absolute inspiration. I'm a dream you're having. I won't hurt you. I just want you to do something for me, and then you'll wake up. Slowly, the little man lowered his hands and looked up again. A dream, is it? Well, I should have guessed. Yes, of course, it would be. The whole rotten war is nightmare enough, though, without giants and... and... He stared around Omri's room. Still in all, perhaps it's a change for the better. At least it's quiet here. Can you bring your bag and climb out? I need your help. The soldier now managed a rather sickly smile and tipped his cap in a sort of salute. Right you are, with you in a tick, he said, and picking up the bag, clambered over the edge of the cupboard. Stand on my hand, Omri commanded. The soldier did not hesitate a moment, but swung himself up by hooking his free arm around Omri's little finger. Bit of a lark, this, he remarked. I won't half enjoy telling the fellows about this dream of mine in the trenches tomorrow. Omri carried him to the spot where Little Bear sat, holding his leg, which was still bleeding. The soldier stepped down and stood, knee deep in carpet pile, staring. Well, I'll be jiggered he breathed. A bloomin' Indian. This is a rum dream. And no mistake. And wounded, too. Well, I suppose that's my job, is it? To patch him up? Yes, please, said Omri. Without more ado, the soldier put the bag on the floor and snapped open its all but invisible catches. Omri leaned over to see. Now he really did need a magnifying glass. And so badly did he want to see the details of that miniature doctor's bag that he risked sneaking into Gillian's room. Gillian always slept late. And anyway, it wasn't seven o'clock yet. And his pinch and pinching his from his secret drawer. By the time he got back to his own room, the soldier was kneeling at Little Bear's feet, applying a neat tourniquet the top of his leg. Omri peered through the magnifying glass into the open bag. It was amazing. Everything was there. Bottles, pill boxes, ointments, some steel instruments, including a tiny hypodermic needle and as many rolls of bandages as you could want. Omri then ventured to look at the wounds. Yes, it was quite deep. The horse must have given him a terrific kick. That reminded him. Where was the horse? He looked around in a fright, but he soon saw it, trying forlornly to eat the carpet. I must get it some grass, thought Omri, meanwhile offering it a small piece of stale bread, which it ate gratefully, and then some water in a tin lid. It was odd how the horse was not frightened of him. Perhaps it couldn't see him very well. 
There now, he'll do, said the soldier getting up. Omri looked at the Indian's leg through the magnifying glass. The wound was bandaged beautifully. Even Little Bear was examining it with obvious approval. Thank you very much, said Omri. Would you like to wake up now? Might as well, I suppose. Not that there's much to look forward to, except mud and rats and Germans, shells coming over. Still, got to win the war, haven't we? Can't desert, even into a dream. Not for long. That is, duty calls and all that, eh? Omri gently picked him up and put him into the cupboard. Goodbye, he said. Perhaps sometime you could dream me again. A pleasure, he said this soldier cheerfully. Tommy Atkins, at your service. Any night, except when there's an attack on. None of us get any to sleep to speak of then. And he gave Omri a smart salute. Regretfully, Omri shut and locked the door. He was tempted to keep the soldier, but it was too complicated just now. Anyway, he could always bring him back to life again if he liked. A moment or two later, he opened the door again to check. There was the orderly, bag in hand, standing just as Omri had last seen him at the salute. Only now, he was plastic again. Little Bear was calmly putting on his blood-stained leggings. Good magic, he remarked. Leg feel good. Little Bear, what will you do all day while I'm at school? You bring bark of tree. Little Bear make longhouse. What's that? Iroquois house, need earth, stick posts in. Earth, posts, earth, posts, bark. Not forget food, weapons, tools, pots, water, fire. There was no quarrels at breakfast that morning. Omri gulped down his eggs and ran. In the greenhouse, he found a seed tray already full of soil well pressed down he carried that secretly upstairs and laid it on the floor behind the dressing up crate which he was pretty sure his mother wouldn't shift even if it was her cleaning day then he took his pen knife and went out again fortunately one of the trees in the garden had the sort of bark that came off easily a silvery flaky kind he cut off a biggish strip and then another to make sure. How long was a longhouse? He pulled some grass for the horse. He cut a bundle of thin, strong, straight twigs and stripped off their leaves. Then he went back to his room and laid all these offerings beside Little Bear, who was seated outside his teepee, apparently saying his prayers. Omri, came his mother's call from downstairs. It's time to go. Omri took out of his pocket the corner of toast he'd saved from breakfast and cleaned out the last of corned beef from the tin. There was some corn left as well, though it was getting, getting rather dry by now. He filled up Action Man's beaker with water from the bathroom, pouring a little into the horse's drinking lid. The horse was munching the fresh grass with every sign of enjoyment. Omri noticed its bridle had been replaced with a halter, cleverly made of a length of thread. Omri, just coming. The others have gone. Hurry up. You'll be late. One last thing. Little Bear couldn't make a longhouse without some sort of tool besides his knife. He'd need an axe. Frantically, Omri rummaged the biscuit tin. Ah, a knight, wielding a fearsome-looking battle axe. It wasn't right, but it was better than nothing and would have to do. In a second, the knight was locked in the cupboard. Omri! One second! What are you doing? Crash! The axe was being used on the inside of the cupboard door. Omri wrenched it open and snatched the axe from the startled hands of the knight, who had just time for one horrified look before he was reduced to plastic again. By the time... By the slamming of the door. Never mind. He had looked most unpleasant, just as knights must have looked when they were murdering the poor saccharines in Palestine. Omri had little time for knights. The axe was beautiful, though. 
shining steel with a sharp edge on both sides of the head and a long, heavy steel handle. Armory laid it at Little Bear's side. Little Bear, but he was still in a trance, communicating with his ancestors, Armory supposed. Well, Little Bear would find everything when he came to. There was quite a trail of split earth leading behind the crate. Armory flashed down the stairs, grabbed his parka and his lunch money, and he was gone.